for God so loved, what is it? Um, the world? Oh the yeah, world. that's what we should be <laughs> focusing on. Bonus points if you're watching this video outside because we're talking about Earth Day. That is what's coming up this coming Sunday at Riverside. We will be focusing, celebrating. I mean, every day is Earth Day, but this Sunday in particular will have a unique emphasis. A couple things to touch on. We have a guest preacher, Caitlin Curtis. We'll talk more about her in a minute. We don't know what text she's preaching, so we're going to talk about the narrative lectionary text because Adrian and I like those, and Earth Day. So, um, Adrian, hi. How are you? Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. We made it. We made it from uh, Easter Resurrection Sunday till today. Uh, we're still in the Easter season, but it was a glorious, glorious Holy Week, glorious Easter. And it's just, oh, Holy Humor Sunday, man, that was dynamite. Um, yeah, I'm just glad to be here. Grateful for um, guest preachers this month. <laughs> 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 Once in a while, that's a nice little uh, a breath for you, I'm sure, from all the work and sermon writing and everything that are on your shoulders. And this Sunday is one of those where you get a, a moment of a break. So we'll, let's, let's talk about all three of those things, Earth Day, the text, and the guest preacher. Let's start with the guest preacher. Who, who are we going to hear from this Sunday at Riverside? Uh, so we're really blessed to be joined this Sunday by Caitlin Curtis. Um, she is... Oh, many things, an author, an essayist, a poet, storyteller, public speaker, um, I think powerful for our gathering on Sunday is the fact that she's an indigenous person who has a, a vision for what it means to live in harmony and wholeness with the earth and with one another. She's got a few books out, I know. Um, I'm trying to look at her website. Her most recent is called Living Resistance, an Indigenous Vision for Seeking Wholeness Every Day. Uh, so there, and that's just one of a few I know that she has listed. So she will bring, I know, a whole lot to our community, to everyone who gets to engage with us this coming Sunday. Uh, and I think it'll be especially pertinent with Earth Day in particular. So let's go there. How does Earth Day intersect with the liturgical calendar? Because last time I checked, you know, it wasn't in the whole Advent, Epiphany, Easter, Pentecost rhythm of things. So how did Earth Day sneak into our rhythm at Riverside? It's it's not in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, th I think the way you opened us was really powerful when you say every day is Earth Day, because I think it takes us back to um, the great sheet in in the beginning because uh, in the beginning God is creating this incredible planet uh, this earth this the cosmos that we uh, call our home and I think to pause um, at, at least one Sunday if not as you suggested every Sunday to be grateful for and mindful of uh, the planet is is important. And so Earth Day, I think, has taken on a lot of uh, energy, particularly in the last few years, given uh, the, the terrible ways that we have been treating God's creation. And I think it's important for us at Riverside uh, to pause along with, you know, so many other faith communities and, and people who care about the planet and think about what we might do, what we are doing uh, to ensure that there is a planet for the creatures that God has uh, created. I mean, if you really wanted to just go all out, you could find like a special day for every Sunday. But I think there are some that just have, like you described, an alignment that is so in sync with what we are called to do as, you know, people of God, as the church in the world. And, and when the world at large is celebrating and caring for the earth in a particular focus, I feel like we would just be missing something if the church was like, oh, you know, business as usual, you can go hug trees, we're just gonna, you know, no, I mean, this is when we get to, if nothing else, highlight the, the divinity found within the natural world around us. And we get to point a spotlight on the sacred nature of this seemingly secular celebration of Earth Day, it's actually seeped with the sacred. That was some good alliteration I had there. That was some fantastic alliteration. Um, I would add this as well. I think uh, as a justice-loving church that cares mm -hmm. about um, God's um, in-breaking power for people and for planet, I think Earth Day is a natural uh, celebration for the Riverside Church. We, we have to be mindful of how we're spending our money using our resources, um, the foods that we're eating, the things that we're putting on our bodies, all of the things. I mean, this is, is very much a stewardship, you know, the management of our lives um, issue. 
you know, the earth and, and its resources, who is benefiting and who is um, not benefiting, but also who's being harmed by the choices we make. And certainly the church is involved in that. Certainly um, our church is involved in that. Um, you know, Riverside has taken steps over the years to um, to be more mindful about where we invest dollars and who we um, partner with. Uh, we were really struck, I think, last year when we had Fletcher Harper, Reverend Fletcher Harper from Green Faith here, um, helping us to think about fossil fuels and the um, powerful and um, impactful ways that we can can care for the earth. You know, recycling is important, but um, those fossil fuels and our divestment from them and divestment from organizations that are connected to them is really one of the, the most powerful, impactful ways for us to be involved. And so we're thinking about those things at Riverside and, and encouraging our, our colleagues to think about them as well. That's so essential because it's not to say that the individual actions aren't helpful or necessary, the recycling, the choosing to walk instead of driving or taking a car, the, you know, those, we, if anything, those are the values that we need as individuals for the society to then begin to pivot and make those shifts for it to just seem so out of sync. Wait a minute, I value this. Why are we then as a society doing that? And then we can feel that dissonance and hopefully continue to make those necessary shifts to continue to be the best possible stewards of this planet that we're calling home. Exactly. Um, and I think as people of faith, um, I think we understand ourselves as having an even deeper responsibility. Uh, stewardship really matters to us. Um, it, the planet matters to us on a human level because it is our home and it's the home of the, of the folks that we love. But for folks who follow a carpenter named Jesus and who take the book that we love seriously, this call to stewardship and, and um, uh, responsibility for the planet and the creatures is, is, is another level of care that we're called to. So what about all the people who are going to say, wait a minute, I've read the ending. This whole thing burns up and we just get on a spaceship called heaven. See you later. We're off. How do you engage with that approach when they're like, Earth Day doesn't matter. Heaven's all that's important. Um, well, I think we don't want to be on a burning planet. Um, so I think you know, that timing could be off. We want to, you know, I think you want to get on the spaceship before it burns up, but who knows when that's going to happen. Um, but I think we can just look not too far uh, to see the ways that things are being disruptive. I mean, we had high winds in New York City um, in the last uh, in the last seven days. Um, we've had um, unusual rainfall in New York City in the last seven days. So much water on the ground um, in Poughkeepsie, where I was earlier uh, this week, that the, the ground couldn't absorb it. There, there's something there's something wrong with that. Um, there's something wrong with um, the ocean water becoming toxic. That's affecting our food supply. It's affecting the food supply of other creatures. Um, and, you know, there's a cyclical... Um, effect there. Um, poisons that we put on produce, you know, get into the water cycle and affect our, uh, our, our food supply, but also has in fact, uh, impacts on our, on our own health, on uh, diseases and cancers. A friend of mine said, uh, there's research that shows that the cancers that we are getting and, and uh, potentially struggling with and dying from have more to do with what we're eating, you know, the things that we put on our face, makeup, creams, shampoos, lotions, and the, and the clothing, things that we wear. Um, it's environmental things that are making us sick. We need to be pausing and thinking about these things as good stewards of the land, but also as uh, neighbors who um, love one another as we love ourselves. That is so essential. Yeah. And recognizing loving our neighbor extends even beyond just the human neighbors, but it's the rocks and trees and skies and seas and all the, anything that is living, whether that's mammals or amphibians or plants, how do we care for and cultivate all of it? Because right there in the, in the beginning, like you said, you know, some people will take that, you know, uh, 
the the story the 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 myth of adam and eve and saying see they're supposed to have dom they're dominating the land it's like no no they're not supposed to dominate it in control they're supposed to cultivate it as gardeners and care for it and see it flourish and then you know you can see some mirrors of that in john's gospel when you see so much of genesis paralleled and how does mary um what who does mary think that jesus is at the resurrection the gardener. Hello, gardener. What have so here's Jesus the gardener, and we're called to cultivate this good earth as well. Maybe even the whole cosmos, if we want to help, you know, not colonize it, but cultivate it uh, for the sake of its ongoing existence and however it takes shape. Yeah, and I like the word tending. Uh, you mm. know, uh, Jesus left and uh, gave us the Holy Spirit. We'll be um, celebrating that in just a few weeks. But the the call is to tend to, to as you yeah. said, care for, uh, nourish, and allow to flourish this uh, gift that we've been giving. And, and um, we're not tending very well. We're sort of yeah. taking and dumping and depositing in ways that are mm. harmful without uh, a gaze towards uh, who's next, our children, yeah. someone else's children, grandchildren, you know, indigenous folks would say to the seventh generation. And we have done things and created things that we're told won't uh, disintegrate mm. um, like plastics, not even not forget about seven generations, like <laughs> millennia. Um, these yeah. things will not go back to the earth. And we've done that. Yeah. Whew. Well, it, it definitely shows how there is a spirituality baked into this particular day, and it offers lessons that we need to be hearing and heeding, not just one day, but every day. Uh, I think that is so, so essential. At Riverside, we have a group, the Beloved Earth Community, uh, who is particularly focused on the ways that we care for uh, and are part of a sustainable ecosystem on this planet. And we're grateful for their work and all the ways they continue to invite our whole congregation forward. For anyone watching, listening in another church, if you don't have a group like that, maybe this is a good day to think about starting one. What can be the task force that is giving particular focus to that intersection of the spirituality of caring for this created world around us? And then how does that seep into all that we do? I mean, paper bulletins, what happens with them on a Sunday after they're done? There's just little things that can, again, shift the individual values to then think about the larger investments we're making and how do we need to move in all these necessary directions? Because I want my kids to have a beautiful earth. I, I, I don't want people who are living in coastal regions to have to migrate simply because the waters rise at an unnecessary rate. There is work that we can and should be doing uh, for the sake of all of us, which seems like what the gospel has always been all about. It's not just some of us or the people from my uh, uh, passport identification region, but it's for God so loved, what is it? Um, the world? Oh the yeah, world. that's what we should be <laughs> focusing on. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you talked about the small things. I believe this issue, like so many issues of love and justice that we uh, bring to church and bring into our faith communities, it can feel overwhelming for sure. Yeah. Uh, just start with one thing, start with one manageable thing. And maybe this year you only do that one thing. Um, but there was a, a woman I worked with who did a lot of uh, AIDS relief work um, around the world. And she said that she learned from a, a wise mom in Africa, in an African uh, country, who said, everything you do matters and nothing you do matters. So, but if we're yeah. all walking around thinking that the nothing I do matters, then those plastic bottles, you know, start to pile up. Um, yeah. But if you bring your, your um, reusable cup, um, you know, you're making that one small difference. And if you can get your faith community to think about what the one small thing is that you're going to do, I think that's how we start to do the drip, drip, drip change yep. of justice in the world. Yep. One small thing done consistently and repeatedly will start to change the world. Like, like imagine if a church in this year said, okay, no more styrofoam cups. We're going to do cardboard cups. At least those can be recycled. And then, okay, no more cardboard. We're going to use ceramic, washable, reusable, bring your own. You know, it's just little things that can be very practical. And then, like you said, over time, five, 10 years from now, that just becomes part of our habit and our rhythm and the way in which we live in the world and the way we used to do things would then seem so foreign. Like, I, I can't wait until, um, you know, hopefully it's within this next generation or two when the concept of a 
fuel powered vehicle seems so ridiculous. Why would you ever do that? Like I think of it like a seatbelt. I had a friend, Matt Crick, uh, he's a pastor now in California who talked a lot about eco theology and he talked about the new seatbelt because once upon a time, seatbelts were a brand new invention. I don't want to wear that. It's uncomfortable. I don't need that. It's unnecessary. Uh, and, and now we've all pretty much adopted it as just what we do for the safety of all of us. Right, well, right. what about the way in which we care for the environment? I don't want to do that. It's uncomfortable. Oh, a truck's got to sound like this, you know? It's like, well, when we can start moving beyond that egocentric, whatever blinders we have on, we can realize this is about all of us. And this becomes the new norm that we all just need to hold and maintain. Yeah. Um, I, I remember growing up, Jim, you're probably too young, but um, riding on the back seat of a car that had what we called a bench seat. Oh, yeah. There was no, oh, yeah. And sliding when my grandparents would turn, when my grandpa would turn the corner, I'd be on the right hand side of the car and he would turn and I would just slide. Woo! <laughs> and it was great fun because we didn't have seatbelts. There was also a hump in the back of the car that I would stand on and I would put one arm around my grandpa and one arm around my grandpa and just be leaning on the front seat. If we had hit something, my little body would have gone jettisoning through the, the, the windshield. But again, um, hitting those bumps was yeah. so much fun. And we, we just didn't have seatbelts. So anyway, this is not a conversation about seatbelts. It's not a seatbelt <laughs> sermon. But um, I love the analogy for how we are able to move and shift and change and do a new thing. Um, and we are people who follow a God of new things. Mm. Um, and we certainly want to do uh, whatever the thing is, new or not, to help preserve this planet that we've been given, which is pure gift, pure yeah. gift, pure grace. Um, the waterways, uh, the clouds, the mountains, the grass, the flowers that are mm. blooming up in our part of the world. Um, it's just a gift and a grace. And what an insult to God for us to not try to maintain it in the way that we've been um, tasked with maintaining it. Mm. Well, that's Earth Sunday, Earth Day. It's going to be a beautiful Sunday at Riverside. Hopefully, wherever people are worshiping. Uh, I mean, if you can bring bring in some trees. Do I have? I have. A, this is this is not a real tree, sadly. But you know, bring in something. You know, make it make it the real stuff. Take church outside. Enter the divine cathedral that's been blooming all around us. Whatever it might be. Uh, or if nothing else, when you leave church, be like, okay, I'm going to leave church to go to church. Take a walk. Breathe the fresh air. And realize you can, you can do that every Sunday too, not just Earth Day. Uh, we didn't talk about the text. It's Acts chapter 17. Uh, this is the first time we're getting Paul. So I'll just maybe give a half thought. And if you have a half thought, we can, in case anyone is preaching it wants it. Um, this is Paul at Thessalonica. So the, the narrative lectionary gives us um, a few verses from chapter 17 of Acts where Paul is at Thessalonica. And then we read the first chapter of Thessalonians. Oh, that's kind of fun. The letter he wrote to them. My favorite, Paul... Um, thing to just share with the world, because this is the first time we're getting the story of Paul in the Nerd Electionary. Some people think that his name used to be Saul and he changed it to Paul, but that's not true. This is not an Abram to Abraham, you know, God changed his name kind of a thing. Uh, after his conversion, he still goes by Saul because Saul was his Hebrew name. So when he's in a Hebrew Jewish context, he used the Jewish name Saul. And when he's in a Greek context, which he ends up spending most of his time in, he uses his Greek name, Paul. It has nothing to do with conversion. It has to do with context. So that's just my favorite little Paul trivia for everyone to know. We're going to talk about that in open Bible study because I like that kind of stuff. Do you have any, any thoughts on this Thessalonica stuff? Have you even looked at it close enough to give us anything in, in, in from your mind? I've looked at it just a little and it, it sort of piggybacks on what you were saying um, because, you know, Paul's activity takes him throughout the Mediterranean. Um, and as you're suggesting to increasing numbers of folks who are Gentiles, uh, these are the very earliest Jewish Jesus believers. Um, and I think what you're saying about his name is really also important about his ministry, which is pa Paul's ability to adapt, to adapt to mm. the situation that he found himself in. And I would just say, as we are dealing again with so many justice issues, caring for the earth, upcoming presidential elections, um, red and blue and purple and uh, division in the church, division in the world, um, uh, that we could take a lesson perhaps from Paul and his ability to adapt and to be um, 
what is needed to speak the language of the time and the people that he's with, but also to listen in such a way that allowed him to speak the language to the time and mm -hmm. the people that he was in. I think there is a good model for us in Paul because he was able to do uh, more to spread the gospel of Jesus mm -hmm. than any other person. Um, I think because of his great gift to uh, adapt and to listen. That I mean, I feel like that's, that's a, on-ramp right there to Earth Day. And like, we need to continue to adapt and to listen. And what do we, one point we weren't as aware of the environmental impact humans were making, but now we are. Now we are. So what are we gonna do about it? Just let it keep, you know, going to hell? Or are we gonna actually do our best to keep cultivating and tending to this good earth that we are stewarded and tasked with? That's right. That and Mama Maya Angelou said, when you know better, you do better. So do better. <laughs> Because <laughs> now you know. Oh, well, look at that. We covered all the things. Guest preacher, Caitlin Curtis, going to be fantastic. Earth Day, we, we preached like two and a half sermons, I think, just now on that. And a little bit of dipping our toe into Acts 17 and Thessalonians. There's a lot of good stuff going on. So as always, you can join us this coming Sunday at Riverside. We'll be in the building at the Upper West Side, West Harlem, uh, right there on Riverside Drive. Or you can join us online, trcnyc.org. Gets you all the information, address, location, live stream, all that's right there. Worship starts starts at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Music begins at 10.30 a.m. Carillon, Oregon. It's all fantastic. You should see it and hear it. Uh, then Open Bible Study happens before all that, 9.30 a.m. Sundays are just a good day. In the room, online, lots of choices. It's going to be a fantastic, wonderful day as it tends to be. And, uh, and after and then we show? keep going. Virtual coffee What's... hour, after oh, worship, oh. virtual coffee hour. Yeah. And if you're in the building, Beloved Earth will be hosting a cosmic walk where you can learn about the formation of yeah. God's beautiful cosmos. And we hope that you'll uh, join us for all or some of that. That looks so good. I was just reading through the program for that. It looks, it's going to be incredible. Whew. It's going to be a good day. It is. All right. Well, we'll, we'll talk to you all again next week and we'll have more good stuff coming. We're, we still got a little more book of acts to go and then uh pentecost is coming in a bit but we're not there yet so keep keep save your red shoes red pants for a few few weeks from now talk to you soon bye everybody